Let's get started. Can you hear me? So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Space Odyssey. Learn how New York entrepreneurs, investors, academics, and enthusiasts are looking to commercialize the space industry. It's a big surprise to see so many people here on a Friday night. So uh, we're very happy to have you here. My name is Steve Nakamoto, and I'm a founding member of New Space NYC, the organization that is devoted to promoting opportunities for commercialization of space in your city area, and it's organizing this event. And we are very happy to have as uh, partners Columbia, venture capital community. Uh, I don't know if you can get up, but I was here, but we'd like to thank her. Also, the Columbia Startup Lab for providing the venue, and Space Angels Network that has contributed with wine and cheese. So help yourselves in the back. Before introducing our panelists, let me start asking a very important question. Who's a fan of Star Wars here? <laughs> Who's a fan of uh, Star Trek? Okay, so I think this is the right audience. <laughs> with all the excitement around SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, reaching out to space no longer seems to be a distant dream. Our objective tonight is to share some of the thinking about how recent developments in the space industry are creating business opportunities for investors, inventors, entrepreneurs, and enthusiasts. Tonight, we are fortunate to have a very distinguished group of specialists leading the discussion. And I would kindly like ask the audience to wait until I introduce all the speakers before giving a round of applause. We are proud to have Esther Dyson here, an angel investor, philanthropist, commentator. Esther is a leading angel investor, philanthropist, and commentator focused on breakthrough efficacy and healthcare, government transparency, digital technology, biotech, and space. She recently founded HICA, which just launched its way to Wellville contest of five places, five years, five metrics. She's a founding member of Space Angels Network and has invested in X4, Nanorex, Space Adventures, iPhone Aircraft, and more. She also sits on the board of 23B, X4, Mira, and then the work in the Forum Global Agenda Council on Fostering Entrepreneurship. Ian Fichtenbaum, here on the left, is the Vice President of AIEC, an airspace conglomerate and buyout firm, and an advisor to Outernet, a global satellite media company. Previously, he was a VP to the Near Earth, an investment bank dedicated to satellite, airspace, and wireless industries. He is an alum of McGill and UGC, and also pro alum of the natural space industry, university. And just today, again, was shared with us the big news that he became an advisor to the board of members. John Ambrashkin, he's marketing business and, and development at Honeybee Robotics. Honeybee Robotics, we're gonna hear a lot about it. Uh, He's an experienced marketing and communication specialist with a passion for sustainable development and new technologies. For several years, he was he's provided PR, marketing strategy, and pipeline research for companies in the manufacturing and energy sectors. He brings a passion for building strong partnerships and developing business opportunities. He's expanding his knowledge of environmental engineering in Colombia's MS program while helping deploy group Rubani and automated systems to improve the way we live. I'm proud to announce that as a Siva faculty, or Columbia faculty, on the love, I'm happy to have uh, here in, the, in, the, in our panel, like half of the members have some kind of affiliation with Columbia. And uh, being here at the Columbia Startup Lab, it's a uh, very <coughs> proud of uh, Columbia's engagement and with the space industry as well. Dad Southern, uh, Final Frontier Design. He's the CEO of uh, Final Frontier Design, a space design firm specializing in high-tech materials and designs for commercial space flight. He has acted as principal investigator for three SPIRs contracts with NASA Johnson, Johnson Space Center since 2011, uh, developing final frontier designs and advanced pressure garment technology. 
collaborative design is currently pursuing FAA and NASA human rating certification for its IDA We also have Vivek, our good friend Vivek, uh, doing work with business development at Team Indus. Vivek Vital is responsible for business development at Team Indus, India's first space startup and leading contender at the Google Lunar X Prize. He's, he has over 10 years of international experience in capital markets, consulting, training, business analysis, and project management. Previously, he worked at leading investment banks, hedge funds, consulting firms, and analytical software companies such as RBC, IBM, and the Brothers. <coughs> Last but not least, here to my right, Dave Rose, CEO of Rose Tech Ventures. Dave Rose is an Inc. 500 CEO serial entrepreneur and super angel investor in startup technology companies and founder of New York Angels, an early stage technology investment group. He's managing partner, managing partner of uh, Rose Tech uh, Ventures, a venture fund focused on internet-based businesses, and CEO of Gust, which operates a collaboration platform for early stage angel investments. He's a founding member of the Space Angel Network that's supporting us tonight, and associate founder of Singularity University. He's also a co-founder of AREA, a real estate technology accelerator program here in New York. In 2014, David wrote a, wrote a book, Angel Investing, The Best Guide <laughs> to Making Money, <laughs> to Making Guidance, <laughs> and Master over here. Considering Investing in the Startups. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. tonight by asking a question to Esther and to Ian. And the first question is, what are your views about the recent developments in commercialization of space? Now we've seen, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Virgin Galactic, about uh, SpaceX. To what extent do we think that this is an industry that is already uh, in development and what's the future that we can foresee uh, for all of us? And ladies first. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll start with a slightly longer perspective, but not a longer answer, which is I started out in the PC business. I watched as mainframes got basically disrupted by PCs. And I think we're seeing the same thing happen in space. The sort of like the mainframe rockets are getting disrupted by x and SpaceX and, and Maybe Jeff Bezos, we don't know. <coughs> and the other big trend also from the tech world is the internet being privatized. Once it was privatized, all this commercial energy was unleashed and amazing things happened. And you know, you have people from the old world saying, Oh my god, a logo on a rocket, how disgusting. And other people saying, Great, what a wonderful source of funding. We'll we'll you know, we'll fund this rocket with marketing and yeah, quick logos on our spacesuits and whatever. So from my perspective, the thing that's happening now is the kind of disappearance of NASA from short-term space travel has left a huge market vacuum uh, with some very weird politics, uh, mostly built around labor forces that build stuff for NASA. I mean, if, if you want to understand people's <coughs> politics, it's not really left or right or should the free market do stuff, but where do the traditional space companies, the cost plus big contractors, have their employment? And that kind of tells you more about where the politics are than anything else. Uh, at the same time, new space itself, its biggest problem is a lack of good managers. I'm on the board of Xcore. Uh, Jeff Grayson, our CEO, recently helped us lead the search for someone to replace him as CEO and liberate him as Chief Technology Officer so that he could do the fun stuff and finally have someone else deal with the boring stuff. And also, frankly, be a better manager of you know, what is turning from an R&D shop to a business that has marketing and sales. We also work with a Dutch company. 
that's the kind of transformation that some of these companies have yet to make. There's what I call sort of the billionaire project problem. Uh, Elon Musk brought in a real CEO, but there are a lot of billionaires who still would rather have these companies run by, I don't know, I'm not inside of them, but it's time to get a new generation of professional management. That doesn't mean they need MBAs, but yeah, these are no longer projects. They are companies, and the discipline that investors bring to companies like x and SpaceX, I think, are needed throughout the industry. <coughs> So uh, I'm going to uh, answer the question in a typical Wall Street fashion. One, uh, I'm going to answer it the way I want to answer, uh, answer it. And two, I'm going to talk my book in, in the process. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the, the thing that you uh, should be aware of uh, about the, the space industry and the use of space nowadays is just how much infrastructure we, act we now have. I mean, if you, if you consider everything that we now have, there's over a thousand uh, operational satellites of various sorts uh, buzzing around uh, in low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit or uh, high orbits. Uh, uh, we have, I counted, at least 18 different spaceports in the United States alone. We have an amazing industrial base uh, that needs to be disrupted, but it is still an amazing industrial base churning out um, uh, spacecraft of all sorts. Uh, we have, worldwide, there are about 100 launches done every year, and that number has been rising since 2004. And a lot of those rockets have spare space, and so, you know, there's lots of places to put things. We have an operational space station that uh, has six people on it, and ha there are eight to ten flights various cargo or, 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 or cruise ships that go there every single year. Um, and so you have a logistics train that is there to be done. You have a navigation and communications. A GPS uh, system is just as good in low Earth orbit as it is in the middle of the desert. Uh, the TDRS system, which provides communications to the station, is just as good for any vis visiting vehicle as it is for the station, and you can use it to communicate in, on the ground anywhere you are, at least in low Earth orbit. So, um, when it comes to doing something new in space, um, I'm not a big fan of building a whole new rocket and building a whole new space station uh, just to do that. I like uh, reusing uh, parts uh, uh, wherever I can, or reusing somebody else's infrastructure. And uh, two uh, companies that I'm heavily involved, involved with uh, do just that. Uh, one, uh, as you can see in my bio, prominently is Outernet. Outernet is, Outernet did something beautiful, which is said, how can we make a free global information service that gets around any kind of control of the internet? Uh, and the solution was to have, do one-way broadcast off of satellites. And there happens to be a heck of a lot of satellite capacity out there. Uh, and, and all you need really is the, the merging of media and tech know-how in order to turn that into a, a global information uh, service. And I'm proud to say that uh, we're well on our way to doing that broadcasting over three continents. Uh, soon going to be global, uh, global coverage. We just did an Indiegogo campaign where we sold uh, well over uh, 4,000 lantern devices that anyone will be able to receive information, like Adelaide shortwave radio. So that, and a lot of that was done off of existing satellites, and there will be more existing satellites. Eventually, we'll, uh, Outernet will have its own satellites. So that's one case of using existing infrastructure. Nanorex is the other uh, company that I'm heavily involved with. Um, that uh, saw something else that was part of the infra uh, in existing infrastructure, which is that NASA has to send itself, uh, its stuff up to the station, and it has access it has, you know, a manifest aboard, you know, five or six different vehicles that go up to the station. So what NASA has done is create a logistics train, unlike anything that anyone has ever put together in the space industry. And NRX saw an opportunity that they can put things in the, the spare spots there and say we can ride up on different vehicles to the station that's manned up or 
person up there or whatever, whatever was they're using nowadays. Um, uh, staff, that's a good one. I'm sorry. Um, staff, uh, you know, 24 7, uh, rides all the time, and you can bring things up, you can bring things down, and they've made a great business of uh, sending experiments up. Uh, up to the station, deploying satellites off of it, hanging, going to soon be hanging things off the outside of the station. So, and again, that's a station that's up there um, and making good commercial use of this, of this incredible asset uh, that, and infrastructure that's already been built. And I'm proud to say I'm a shareholder of both these companies and um, love to see what people can think of to use other, uh, other parts of the space infrastructure. Thanks. So from space to Earth, back to Earth. So I would like to ask David to give back about the opportunities for startups in this context where the space industry is developing. And maybe we can start with David. Um, as you heard, I'm an associate founder of something called Singularity University. <coughs> How many people here have heard of Singularity University? Okay, well, not exactly. <coughs> not exactly. <coughs> there anybody have heard of Singularity you know, in, in, in this crowd. It's a, it's a lot of them. How many have you studied there? Oh, good point. Are there any alums from Singularity you here? Oh, one, two. Okay, okay. Congratulations. Um, so, uh, so, Singularity University is this postgraduate program out of the NASA Research Center uh, in the Valley, um, which is based on the works of Ray Kurzweil and the book The Singularity is Near. Um, it is all about the exponential pace of change in technology. Um, that we are, we have, if we ever had, we are no longer at a, a linear pace. We are at an exponential pace, which means it is, it is growing like this. And we are now at about the knee of the curve. And if you think, if you think about um, exponentials, you know, doubling every you know, year or two years or 18 months or whatever it is, if you start really, really small, like 0 0.001, and you double it, you get 0 0.002. And the increment is only 0 0.001, so the tiny you can't see it. The next increment is only 0 0.002 and then 0 0.004, you still can't see it. So if you were to graph this, it looks like a very, very, very slow rise over here. Then all of a sudden you get to, you know, 1, you know, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30, 64, and the curve begins to go like this. And so, you know, in the, in the beginning of human history, you know, through the Industrial Revolution, effectively you were at this flat part of this what's called power curve, and it, and, and it was a very, very slowly rising one, and it seemed like it was flat. And then you sort of get to the Industrial Revolution and it begins to accelerate through the 20th century. You know, space flight, people on the moon, amazing. And we're like at the knee of the curve where things are all of a sudden, you can see things are accelerating. But now instead of seeing, seeming flat, it seems like it's a linear acceleration, right? What has happened now is we've now got to the point where we're now, you know, 2 gig, 4 gig, 8 gig, 16, 30, 64, you know, a terabyte, gigabyte, and I know, you know, a, a, a Google of information. And we are now at the point where this technological acceleration is now getting almost a vertical one um, in, a, in a power curve. And, it, and that means that every single thing is changing. The idea of a new space industry or a meetup around this kind of stuff is so incomprehensible to anybody who was, you know, in school back in the dark ages when <coughs> some of us was, was, in, was in school, um, that, the, that you could have your own rocket, that you could have a company that, that would, would try and, and put a rover on the moon or, or Mars. I mean, it was, it's incomprehensible. But what has happened, this technological change, basic change, has so affected everything that combined with the business changes that have been the result of this, is because technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Technology only exists as applied to the real world. I did a TED talk at the Columbia Engineering School on Johann Gutenberg um, and his venture capitalists and angel investors tracing uh, all of Gutenberg's funding rounds and actually what happened. Gutenberg was a, was a technology entrepreneur who invented the printing press, not out of some love of literature or whatever, but to make friggin' money. I mean, he, would, he, he would actually started as a goldsmith, and he had a business, he had one business that failed, and the other business that failed, and he said, okay, well, he invented this thing over here. And, and, he said, and the only, actually, the only way we know anything about Gutenberg is from all the lawsuits from all of his investors. And, 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 but in, so, so in, in any event, what you have seen, technology changes because it's applied to the business world. And the technology change that we have seen has disrupted every industry you can think of, from the airline industry, where virtually every major U.S. airline went bankrupt in the, in the last couple of decades, to the taxi industry. The value of a taxi medallion in New York City has dropped to, what, 25, 30 percent in the last 12 months, when Uber goes from zero to $40 billion within four years. 
I mean, you cannot name an industry that is not being completely disrupted. And so what technology has done is applied to space, has taken what, what for in the early days of space was this extraordinary institutional, large, corporate, military, industrial, complex, governmentally funded thing, and all of a sudden turned it to like almost social networking. Hey, start a rocket, start a space business. So, you know, I'll do racks, I'll do moons, I'll do rovers, I'll do suits, I'll do, I'll do whatever. Um, and it has opened it up, and, 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 and NASA, with its move to the commercialization of space, recognizing this, and that was really pretty far-sighted, I think, of, 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 of NASA, um, you know, partly you know, out of duress, partly out of, out of inspiration, uh, the idea of, of, you know, taking things out of the federal government's maw, and it's not just a giant, you know, lucky whatever is there, but now, hey, we're going to go buy things commercially opened up the whole world, and so now there, and if you think about how complex the whole space thing is, you get somebody up and down and do whatever you do up there, all these component parts that used to be part of this one giant complex with all of these contractors top down, is now happening bottom up around the world, and there are so many opportunities in every conceivable area, because space is now going to be like, you know, the internet and electricity, and you take it back, so, you know, people here aren't in the electricity business, although everybody, you know, here uses electricity. And, you know, we're not necessarily in the internet business. Well, Esther was in the internet business. She was the first chairman of the internet, those who didn't, didn't know. Um, but everybody else uh, is using the internet to do whatever you're going to do. You are in the internet-enabled business. And I think that ultimately you're going to see space, whether it's GPS or, or anything else, we are going to see in the space-enabled business. And this is an amazing time to get started. Thank you. Talking about being a space company and putting a rover in the moon, that's no better way to continue this conversation with Vivek, who's uh, present Team Indus, and this Team Indus is this, com this company that's been building a rover to put in the moon, and it's a developing country, so not only like the big players here in the US or in, uh, in Russia or China, in fact, you're seeing this, the development of space industry all over the world. Well, thanks, Adi. So I can uh, speak a little bit about my own experience and how I got sucked into this aerospace world. Um, uh, so, you know, I, like Sydney introduced me, I, my primary experience has been with Wall Street and creating systems and risk management, and before that, you know, I was dabbling in physics and PhD, so I always had a passion for this. But then I heard about you guys going to the moon uh, last year, and I said, what do you do? And it turns out they're my childhood friends. Um, so I just called them up, and I said, hey, you guys are going to the moon? And they were like, yeah, sure you want to I said, fine, and the next year, I <laughs> <laughs> So I thought it was extraordinary that these, you know, some private company was going to the moon, and they're all being mocked and derided as these lunatics. And I said, no, no, man, I mean, you know, I'm not of those, and I want to be part of the gang. And, and so to give the long story, in some ways are secondary to pure financial aspects. You know, I can go to the Middle East, and I, and I believe there are some countries there professing to, you know, just boost up their aerospace departments, you know, like space exploration. So if somebody has $5 billion, then don't give to, you know, some established space company. You know. uh, I'll, I'll go for one hundred the cost. It was like a Chinatown box. I mean, I can take your DC for five bucks as opposed to 50 bucks. Right? So, so anyway, I mean, I can just go on and on, but that just gives you some highlight of you know, my own experience and exposure and coming from Wall Street to see, I mean, for such dirt cheap, how can you accomplish such extraordinary goals? And, and a couple of comments about the culture there. I mean, people work harder than in, in this company and companies like this than in investment banks. They work every day, including Sunday. And the dropout rate is zero because, I mean, that's the only game in town, right? You, you have like India's NASA, which is a giant, with a piece of an organization. Or then you have these small stuff. So you know, it's like a cottage industry, and people just love to work, and, and then they work hard, and, and they're getting algorithms and hardware and software, and the, you know, it's all, it's all lined up. And, and the government wants to foster the ecosystem, and, and they're very keen that, uh, you know, that they're, they're success. So, So there are startups all over the world, including here in New York, and uh, we would like to hear from two startups. I don't know if you can call Airbnb Robotics as a startup anymore, but and the question is, to what extent New York can become a hub for uh, space startups? I would like to start with John. Um, so I'm, I'm coming at this from a little bit different perspective than maybe some of the other panelists. Um, uh, first, uh, I'm not an aerospace engineer or an EE or, or an ME, um, and second, because Honeybee is, in some respects, part of the older system, uh, maybe the m more mature uh, aerospace industry than the startup community is represented here. 
Um, so Honeybee is about 32 years old. Uh, we are a New York company founded on the Lower East Side. Uh, a few months ago, we moved to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, so we're neighbors with, uh, with Ted and Final Frontier now. Um, and uh, we build uh, robotics for extreme environments. So that includes um, drills for spirit and opportunity um, back in 2003. Uh, we built the scoop for the Phoenix Mars lander. Um, first drill to look inside rocks on Mars, first, first tool to sample the water on Mars. Uh, more, more recently, we uh, contributed some systems to Curiosity, which is now tasting the organics uh, from the rocks. And we're working on, on technologies for Mars 2020, um, you know, and future sample return missions. Um, so when, when you're talking about you know, a, a huge kind of decades-long project like the ones NASA pursues generally, um, there's not a whole lot of room for error, right? This is all driven by the scientists, at, first and foremost. They, they have certain missions that they want to fulfill. Uh, and then they expect the engineers to figure out um, how to accomplish those scientific goals. And when you have you know, a billion dollar plus mission, um, you know, curiosity level, everything is vetted and re-vetted and there's so little appetite for risk that I'm a little bit jealous of some of the, uh, the, the agile aspects. Um, you know, uh, David's talking about you know, treating space almost like software. You know, there's no barrier to entry. And that's, that's a very um, new concept, I think, when, when you're talking about companies that have a real revenue stream right now rather than being angel or VC funded. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, this is all, all doom and gloom, I don't want to be a wet towel here. Um, you know, NASA and other agencies like DARPA still have a very important role, I think, in nurturing companies. Uh, Honeybee would not have gotten to where we are without uh, things like SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Grants from NASA, which, um, you know, give you, you know, 150 grand to develop a concept and then, you know, on the order of a million dollars to prove that it works with a prototype. Um, and that's, that's, you know, essentially the way a small company can bootstrap itself if you don't have friends and family and you don't have a clear business model for what you're proposing. Um, you know, likewise, DARPA and Defense Department are, are very important when it comes to um, developing new technologies. We're working with DARPA right now on the Phoenix program, which is um, designed to send a servicing satellite up to uh, geo-orbit and repurpose old defunct communication satellites by bolting on new communications and guidance and navigation and, and power modules, um, kind of making a you know, Frankenstein satellite, if you will. Um, and so, the, so the, the barrier to entry there is that um, you know, the, you're working with big, somewhat risk-averse institutions. DARPA definitely likes to push the boundaries. Uh, but if you don't have a big academic uh, background, it's very difficult to get the credibility. You know, there's this, there's this chicken and egg problem where nobody wants to fly something until it's been flight validated. No one wants to be the first because these systems have so little margin for error. So, um, you know, in that respect, I think New York uh, probably, if, it, if it's going to be um, a hub for, for aerospace and, and private space, um, really needs to, to tap its academic institutions. Um, you know, and our, our moderator here and, and most of you guys are affiliated with Columbia or one of the universities in New York. Um, you know, you look at what's happening up in Cornell. Um, you know, Steve Squires was the, the PI on the Mars Exploration Rovers, uh, and there's a, you know, a, a beautiful kind of CubeSat industry going on up there. Um, a lot of it is, you know, a, a really rigorous academic fundamental engineering background plus this kind of scrappy startup, you know, will power themselves on Red Bull and ramen kind of mentality that you get, you know, from, from Silicon Valley. Um, and, and I guess, you know, one other point that I'd like to make is, um, you know, space is not just sending up a satellite. Uh, there's, there's a huge supply chain. And when you look at um, either NASA or private uh, industry trying to send humans up or, or conduct um, science in space or go up to an asteroid for prospecting and space mining. Um, there's, there's this massive supply chain. You know, you need radiation tolerant chips, you need um, textiles like uh, Ted can talk about, you need, um, you know, uh, communications uh, protocols, you need, you need, you know, 3D printing technology. So there's a lot of niches to get involved in space and, you know, I'd be surprised if somebody 
is solely dedicated to a technology for outer space that doesn't have some kind of Earth application or vice versa. Um, and I think kind of bridging that gap would be very beneficial to young companies so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, you look at how long things take to mature, even in a, a fast startup mentality, right, with Virgin Galactic promising year after year, commercial flights are coming in 12 months, and here we are, and they're not ready yet. So, um, you know, ha having, having some kind of plan B or, or diversifying your market a little bit, I think, um, can help, you know, get this industry off the ground and, um, you know, translate some of the academics that New York is great at into uh, the, the, the space sector. Thanks, John. So, that? Yeah, so um, I, I'd like to say, first off, that um, it's great to have kind of robotics in New York City as sort of a big brother and mentor for a company like ours. And I think that John actually touched on a lot of points that I think were a case in point four. Um, Nick and I started this company. Nick is my partner here in black in the front row there. Uh, Nick is an aerospace engineer, worked at Zvezda in Russia making spacesuits for 20 years. His uh, first glove designs flew in space on Mir in 1988. Uh, I, on the other hand, uh, in, I have an MFA in sculpture from the crack. Background in costumes and props here in New York City. I've, I've been costumes and props for a very long time. And uh, so it's a kind of a unique uh, mixture. But uh, I've often said that we started this company sort of by accident. That, uh, Nick and I got involved in uh, a NASA competition uh, for citizen inventors, uh, won some money and some recognition from NASA in that way, and uh, NASA essentially said, oh, you should start a company, you should apply for SBIRs, we think we can contract with you, and my attitude was essentially, if NASA says do that, then I'll do that. <laughs> there, was never, there was never really a business plan to start, uh, to start this company, it was really more, we'll, we'll pursue this one particular contract and see where it leads. And, uh, it has been sort of a struggle for us over the last five years, and we'll have a five-year anniversary here in June. We're very proud of that landmark. Uh, but it's been a struggle for us to find that that business plan, to find uh, some commercial applications for what exactly it is that we're doing. Um, we've transitioned from gloves, uh, specifically EVA spacesuit gloves, starting off to full spacesuits and uh, marketing IVA spacesuits to all kinds of different companies. Uh, but the, the market for that is inherently limited. Uh, there's you know, maximum, uh, historically, you know, companies set records building maybe a dozen spacesuits a year. So uh, we've uh, tried to push beyond the government contracting over the last couple of years. It's really been a focus of ours to, to kind of break the, um, the bust and boom cycle of, of government contracting and find uh, commercial spin-offs for what it is that we're building. And, and, and more and more, I think we define ourselves as a garment company and a, a technical garment company, um, with the spacesuit as sort of a, uh, a centerpiece uh, to, to kind of inspire and, um, and drive uh, some spin-off innovations that are, that are applicable here on Earth. And in the sense that we're a technical garment company, I think it makes perfect sense to be here in New York City. I get a lot of questions from a lot of people, why in the hell are you in New York City in the beginning? stuff for space. You should be in Florida, you should be in Texas, you should be in California. Um, and uh, frankly, there's a lot of things in New York City. It's the biggest market for everything, right? And uh, uh, there's, there's great talent in the garment industry here. Uh, there's facilities for people to build things here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure for, for delivery of systems, and it's convenient to get to Houston and Florida and Spain and wherever else you need to get to. Um, I, more and more, I don't think that the space industry is just in one place, and, um, and uh, so in that sense, it makes perfect sense. Also, uh, this is where I'm from, and uh, I founded the company, and so, of course, we're going to be in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, so, now I would like to invite uh, our guest panelists to ask questions to the other guests. Um, I was wondering if someone would like to start. Oh. Big mouth. Uh, I'll throw out a question to, uh, to the panel, and then we're going to just start with Esther. And, and I, I wonder, uh, given the scale of the really big space missions, I mean, you heard 100 million, 200 million, 400 million bucks, um, and a typical startup, which isn't typically a $400 million startup, 
Um, is is there is it a continuum or a, or a sort of continuous spectrum of, of new space from the one person in a garage with a, with a cat and no budget, then all the way up to creating you know uh, you know version you know galactic or or, is, or are there discrete bands? There's the, the startup team here. There's the mid size has to be funded by VCs. There's the big size got to be funded by contracts and so on and so forth. Um, I think over time it's it's going to be pretty diverse. I mean, Nanorex, for example is fundamentally an agent uh, broker kind of outfit, as was Space Adventures. Those are, those are low capital requirements. I mean, over time, you build up stuff. Uh, anytime you start building hardware or equipment, it's it ends up being more expensive. You need facilities. Uh, building spacecraft is incredibly expensive. And you know, then don't forget insurance and so forth. But it's, I mean, the whole thing is to see this as an ecosystem, not just to build a spaceship. And the one, the one thing that I thought Sidney missed in his intro was, you know, this is great for investors and people who want to fly. It's also a real source of employment over time. And you know, and you don't need to be an astronaut to be in the space business. You can actually be an accountant. Uh, and a part of our challenge, I think, is, is space is for people to understand that, that it's an exciting industry to work in, even if you're not Mark Keller. Uh, and it's also an interesting business to be in, in terms of, again, the diversity of size and stage, and, and are you focused on intellectual property, or are you running a spaceport? Uh, and I just, I can't resist, you're Russian, I assume, yeah? Because I think you probably designed my gloves, so I'd love to talk to you after. <laughs> for, for those who don't know, Esther is actually trained as a cosmonaut and spent six months in Star City in Russia, um, training as the backup cosmonaut to go to the, uh, the space station. Um, so, and, and for the record, I started my, my first new space company 27 years ago. Um, my company actually created the Risk Mac, which flew on, uh, on uh, STS-43. So. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> New satellite and space projects can come in various sorts. Uh, the big, one, there are many risks involved in something new, a lot of which have to do with market risk, and that's really the, where things that require venture capital money uh, come in. They start small building something and they build up. It is actually also possible, and it happens still regularly, to uh, come in uh, with a lot of money uh, for things where there's a much more defined market. Uh, satellite projects are still uh, funded uh, by various forms of uh, institutional equity, uh, export credit debt, high yield debt to put together a project. I mean, uh, in the last several years, O3B, which is deploying a uh, constellation in medium Earth orbit and is starting to provide service to much better internet access to cruise ships and, and other kind of things. You know, they, were they were funded by a series of, uh, of funding events that ultimately was about 1.2 billion and then it started with you know, some strategic investors, uh, Google and Liberty and HSBC, but also you know, in involved, in involved, got involved a lot of you know, Export credit debt and various other forms of financing. So that you know that was a case of a more defined um, you know, market and project, and we could be seeing more of those, and we we'll could be seeing you know, small venture uh, venture sized things that start in the garage and will build up you know venture uh, venture funding rounds over time. I have a question. So we, more recently, we've, we've heard some cases like uh, Skybox, okay, uh, that's building uh, micro uh, satellites that got from garage to funding four years. More recently, another microsat company expired in 12 months, and from that came to serious, serious A funding. So to what extent these are exceptions in the space industry, or they just reflect the current state of uh, technical development? tech development and related startups, and then maybe David can comment. Well, I, I would say that, that first of all, 
one of the challenges with anything in the entrepreneurial world, whether it's related to space or, or subsea or, or, or surface, is if you believe everything you read in the press, and if you if you level set by what you read in TechCrunch and, and whatever blog you're reading, you'd be way off base. I mean, the fact is that entrepreneurship is tough. How many people here think of themselves as entrepreneurs? So this is a very large, large entrepreneurial kind of crowd. Being an entrepreneur is really tough. It's really, really nastily tough. It's brutishly tough. And most entrepreneurs fail. That's a fact of life. A majority of the entrepreneurs fail. Frankly, a majority of the companies in which we invest fail. And, and, and entrepreneur, you know, angel investors invest in one out of every 40 companies they see. 40 from 39 to 1. And half of those fail. I mean, the best job we can pick picking the 2% who we think are the winners, half of them fail. Uh, VCs invest one out of 400 companies. So every time you see all these things about, oh, wait, wait, is it possible that they went from, from a garage to a series A in, in, in 12 months? Well, yeah, but it's, on the other hand, there were you know, 2,000 companies that didn't. So it's, it's, it's not that it is a unique thing, but those are actually the odds. So it, it, you will see more and more of that happening. Right now, because the exponential change of technology is making the cost of starting anything dropping so drastically that you can't literally by orders of magnitude you know, every every few years, um, the uh, you, you can now start things so cheaply that you don't need to you know, depend on a venture capital fund to drop in twenty million bucks into your pocket to start a company. Everybody here can start a company with open source stuff and, and free things and, and you know shared resources and whatever. Uh, and so, therefore, that means that people like us, angel investors, not giant venture funds, but people investing out of our own pockets, can fund a whole lot of things. That's why there's this, this extraordinary boom. In angel investing, why we're book available for the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and, and so there's a lot of money now at the lower end. People investing you know, small amounts of money. Part of the challenge is there is this you know almost required winnowing of the herd as you get up and get into the Series A and the Series B and the Series C. Um, and there are not that many more companies that you funded at the higher levels, but a lot of companies being funded at the early, early stages. So ultimately, this is good for society. It's good for a competitive Darwinian, you know, Adam Smith economy because you're seeing a lot of creativity and a lot of experimentation happening at the at the lower ends, and then the best things win, no matter how far out they are. If it really works and the bet play pays off, then society benefits. It's not, of course, so great for the entrepreneurs who were in the the, the ones that, that didn't work, um, but that's the business. Can I just add? Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, what's happening is the cost of failure is much less. You can. You can get started and fail for much less money and, and often much quicker, and that is a way of winnowing things out. In the old days, it took much longer to fail, and so it took much longer to get started on the next new thing. Thank you. So in the second half of our event, we'd like to open up a discussion for the audience. So we're going to have a microphone here, and we'd like to speak with you. <coughs> and uh, if you ask a question, please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, so I'm really thrilled. My name is Jason Sherwin. I'm a founder of the company here in the Columbia Startup Lab. It's called the Servo. It does brain imaging for quick decisions. Um, we've been working with athletes mostly. So I'm I'm thrilled that to see something like uh, this, uh, you know, space panel here in New York City. I came to Columbia after my master's and PhD in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the last place I expected aerospace industry to show up, so I'm thrilled that this is going on here. But I've got a huge question about, you know, and we've started to answer it, uh, about like what role New York could fulfill in the space industry, and the analogies to the internet are um, tantalizing, the growth of internet technology and the ability to fail quickly with software is tantalizing. But you know, the the cost of compiling a code is basically zero. Um, it, the risk of compiling a code and testing if it works is basically zero. Um, the cost and the risk of launching people or stuff into space is huge. And so I'm very curious about how, I mean, I understand that there are related industries to space flight that are important. EVA suits have been mentioned, robotic drills have been mentioned, um, but they're heavily dependent on the ability to quote unquote compile the code. In other words, launch it into space. So what I'm wondering is if there's any analogy to previous kinds of development of similar industries like 
flight in the beginning of the 20th century and the 19th century that could be used here to think about what are the principal things that we have to focus on in space industry, in other words, compiling the code, getting it stuff up in a cheaper way. So if you guys have any thoughts on possible in some sense. Uh, it was a very specific technology, trains and tracks and various kinds of fuel and stuff like that. I mean, a hundred years from now, we'll be doing stuff on Mars and we'll be really grateful for the 3D printers because you don't need to have all this stuff in inventory. Uh, synthetic biology is going to be part of space. I, I'm not sure that, I don't, you know, yes, spacecraft, but there's also, once you get into either on the moon or an aster asteroid, it, the lift required is much less. So the economics are going to change dramatically. And that's going to be really interesting. When space gets really exciting is when it's not Earth dependent. It's sort of the difference between the, the camper who takes everything in his tent and, and rolls it up with with the movable tent and the camper who just brings some cloth and sort of builds a place to live on the mountain. And we're, we're still in the, you know, bring everything with you. Right. The big change is going to be when you start mining the moon and, and getting your fuel out of water and you, you know, you're out of the Earth's gravity hole and, and you're, you're eating synthetic biology stuff and, and breathing air that's created by new synthetic plants. Mm -hmm. If I may. Sure. Um, yeah, Esther mentioned the railroads and you know, railroads, uh, aviation technology, I mean, I think those are all good analogies, you know, in large part because there was such public investment, you know, with the railroads you had massive right-of-ways and land giveaways to a few select companies. And when you look at the big, and you guys can feel free to disagree with me here, but... Many which when, failed. Yeah, and, and when, when you look at the, the big successes to date in private space flight, SpaceX is incredible. I don't want to say anything bad about them. Um, they got a huge amount of their funding from the government. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk of how um, innovative they are as a private company, but uh, Orbital Sciences was a private launch company before them. United Launch Alliance is a private company as a government contractor. So, you know, we've been doing similar things, but uh, I think like David says, you know, the, the pace of innovation is increasing and the, the cost of entry and the cost of failure is, is decreasing. Um, but still, if you're talking about living off the land like a, you know, a, a trapper, um, who's going to be the first company or entity to invest in in situ resource utilization? It's going to be a government. Um, you have you have you know planetary resources or um, other companies looking to mine asteroids for for precious metals or mine the moon for helium three. Um, but you know we still need the public funding to to <coughs> get to where this is routine and not boutique. Um, and there's some things that probably just don't scale inherently, because even if there's quadrillions of dollars worth of platinum out there, um, you know, logistically you're limited by how much you can get access to. And if you get access to it, it'll get cheaper. Yeah, good point. <laughs> that's actually a, a great point, okay, and, and that's why what, what NASA did with this whole privatization of space is so fascinating. Where government works best, I mean, I, I started my career in government working for Senator Danny Patrick Moynihan here in New York uh, as his uh, urban affairs expert for a couple of years, and I decided, I was having a lot of fun, but I decided for two years that I really was a, a, an entrepreneur at heart, and I wanted to be in the private sector, because that was the motive power, the energy, and the best government could do was to work at the edges. And in this particular case, what, what the governments are, are, are doing with things like NASA is to is to is to provide um, the you know contracts to say okay we're going to have a competition and we'll contract with you to do this and instead of being part of, of the existing sort of military industrial you know space industrial supply chain all in a NASA project by 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 seeding the first things out there to the private sector um, you know combined with things like the X Prize and, and so on and so forth you were building the capabilities of the industry itself to then go and do other things after that. Yeah. May I disagree? Yeah. I <laughs> You, you said it twice, and the first time I sort of winced, okay. and the second time I grabbed the mic. <laughs> I mean, I don't really see it as NASA creating the private sector. I see it as the private sector showing up and pounding on NASA's door. Pounding on NASA's door. And I mean, 
I was on NASA as an advisory council for two years, and it was, it was absolutely wonderful. I got to go down and was paid to go visit all of NASA's facilities, you know, meet with Charlie Bolton, and figure out everything, and give them advice, which they were completely incapable of taking, because the only advice they can take is the advice that comes with dollars from Congress. And, uh, you know, so I see this responding on one hand to Congress, on the other hand to a lot of startups. No, no, so, so the answer is, of course, Esther is right. And, and, and as we yes, were saying, <laughs> Esther is, I went over Esther is always right. Um, no, but, but, but seriously, as, as, as people who are in, invested in the new world, the new economy, which is by definition disruptive, right? In, in whatever we deal with existing large companies, I mean, other than, a, than an occasional Apple or Amazon or, or something, which is capable of completely reinventing itself and pivoting as a large company, it is so difficult for any large in, you know, commercial organization, let alone a government which is even worse, and it's like foam teeth. And so I was being slightly generous. But it's so, so whether it came from an inspiration by NASA, oh, let's privatize space, or whether it came from, from you know, the private sector feeding out of doing it, the result is now that when that, that, that there, you, you do have a problem, that there are some things that are very difficult to do. You, know, you, you can't do a startup company, oh, let's go, I'll build a space elevator, right? I'll go to the moon. You're not going to do that by yourself. There needs to be some, at, at this point early on, uh, you know, seed for that, and whether it's government funding, whether it's an X prize or something. But what that does is that builds capability, and then you have the ability. Then, like now, we actually have extra space in there, and you can put it on it. Or Space Adventures, which we're, we're uh, both involved in, um, you, can, you can rent the, a, a seat on the on the rocket there. And so, once you have that, the, 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 a little bit up front of coordination and, and governmental dollars helps to build an industry, and the industry it then it's, itself then can begin. Yeah, it's that that is part of the ecosystem. It's not the ecosystem. So, uh, some question in the back. Yeah, hey, I'm uh, Brett Jones. I'm with uh, OP and Mather. And uh, my colleague here, Jamie, and I like to consider ourselves uh, storytellers in order to help our brands win the hearts and minds of their, uh, their audiences. And um, I've been to a bunch of space events since I moved to New York City three years ago. And I've asked it the same question to everybody, so I ask it of you. Um, it seems like space, new space, has a bit of an echo chamber problem. It's a bunch of people talking to themselves about how cool it is. I mean, for example, every year raise their hand and they ask, who is Singularity University? And you ask the random passing by on the street what that is, and they won't know the difference. So, and so my question is, one, uh, does, does new space need the support of the public in order to succeed? And two, if it does, then what is the most important single-minded message that new space companies can communicate to the public in order to popularize space exploration? That's actually a great question. Um, new space uh, shouldn't need um, the support of the you know box populi in order to happen. I mean, it, it does depend on what you're meaning by the public. You mean the voting public, the politically active public, the consumer public. Um, you know, there, there's a crowd, there's a community of people who call themselves space advocates, and it seems like the modus operandi of that, of that crowd is that they promote space as much as possible to the public so that they will support um, more space spending politically so that people have a greater budget for NASA. And so you know, it's a roundabout way of influencing the big wallet that's been sp funding space up to, up to now. Um, you know, if you look at it from a completely different perspective, you know, there's uh, at least uh, 30, 35 million people, uh, households in this, uh, in this country that have uh, satellite TV. Um, there's at least 20 million subscribers to the Sirius XM. Haven't checked their subscribers lately. Um, people use images. People use GPS. Um, schools can use Nanorax um, if if uh, they want to send a, an experiment up to, to, to space. Um, this is the public and the consuming public. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, mobilized. It can be. Or, it, 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 or if you're, you're partial to Adam Smith, that it's uh, it is motivated by the by the invisible hand. Um, so you know, I, I'm, I've become much less of a uh, of a big uh, uh, you know supporter 
of the ad advocacy route. Uh, that it will continue to exist because the government spending will continue to exist. But if you make a, a product and you market it to the world and it supports an infrastructure, um, that infrastructure seems to have every right to exist as long as, of course, it's not hurting anyone else. Um, um, I'd like to sort of point out that uh, you know, we were talking about an analogy for the space industry a little bit earlier there, and uh, I think that it's important to think about space not as um, an end of it in itself, but the fact that the, um, the industries that develop around it to support it are actually important and do actually change things on Earth and change your life. Um, and that's a big uh, message that I think needs to, to get out about the space industry. I think a lot of people outside of this room are going to think, oh, you know, it's cool to get on a rocket and fly into space. Why is that important to me? And there are myriad examples of why it is important, but, but why our um, cell phones work and why, you know, you know why we have instant global communication. And, and uh, to, to plant that seed of possibility of what can happen in the future with more space access, with more um, people going to space and, uh, and non you know, robotic missions to space. Um, you know, to think about the next um, the next manufacturing breakthrough that could happen in microgravity or or in lunar gravity. Um, those sorts of possibilities of changing the world, I think, are, are to me the biggest message of this industry. Yeah. I didn't want to get a uh, so so there was recently a lot of. of, of uh, Florian Press and TV coverage of a, a guy went up in a, in a balloon really, really high up to the edge of space and, and, and jumped out. I, if you were, did, did, did anybody know his name? Yeah. Uh, what? Felix. Alan Eustace beat him, though. Red Bull had the power. Uh, no. That, that's right. Okay. <laughs> that, no, but that's the punchline. Of course, Esther knows because Esther knows everything. But she's, and she's right. But so, so most of you said Felix Baumgartner. Right? Who, oh, in, in, a, in a highly televised thing, you know, monster, you know, you know talk about storytelling. Right? So storytelling, the entire world is transfixed as you go to the balloon with the, with the giant logos on the side of the thing and, and everything else. Who knows that a Google vice president, you know, you know, six months later, goes higher, jumps the big beats the record, and just does it because oh, he wanted to do it, right? So, so the, the number of people, if you ask people who broke the record for free flow, you know, space parachute jump, you know, I bet you, you know, 80 to 90 percent of people on the street will tell you Felix Baumgartner is telling us of Alan Eustace, right? And that's the power of storytelling and the power of advertising and marketing and how you so, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, so my name's Kevin um, um, with the uh, Columbia Business School. Um, and so my question is, what, what is, like, what do you guys see as the, that source of, um, or the promise of wealth that's going to bring, like, the massive, you guys talk about how, so far, it's been mostly government funding. It's been, like, the one that the Soviets in London, like, 50 years ago that we really went into space. Like, what do you guys see as that promise, like, you know, with the, the, the merit of discovering America is the Europeans want to get by the like, spices from India. Like, do you see, well, what do you see in the future is that promise of wealth that's going to bring like more massive private dollars into investing in, in space exploration and things like that? Um, and, and people mention like mining, but I'm not, I'm failing to see how that's going to be, you know, that, that, that consumer of, you know, all this promise. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking too much, so I, I would shut up. Maybe ask one question. I'll take this one out. The best way to make it happen would be an extraterrestrial invasion. <laughs> <laughs> but failing what? that, um, you know, it's, it's a combination of things. I mean, there, there may be one or two ships that came in search of spice, but then there were other things that happened. I mean, part of it is people want to go. Uh, then there are rare minerals. There's the whole Bigelow, you know, lives somewhere else. There's, uh, it's, it's fundamentally sort of mining and, and new territory to do new things on. We can terraform Mars, and then by that time we can come back and terraform Earth. But, <laughs> you know, I, and that genuinely is not a joke. It's, it's always good to have a spare. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, there, there's some very near-term opportunities. You're seeing all this excitement about um, companies like Skybox, um, you know, imaging and connectivity. So it, it's, it, that's all about sending data back to the ground and, and helping connect everybody here. 
Um, that's not a very satisfying answer, though, because then all you're talking about is, you know, a fleet of cheap, um, you know, satellites in low and medium Earth orbit, and you know, there, there's no there's no real vision there beyond making day to day life better. Which, yeah, I mean, maybe that's enough. Maybe it doesn't have to be boldly visionary in terms of uh, you know leaving footprints on another planet, but um, you know, having gigabit uh, download no matter where you are from a satellite. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, probably not going to get people all, all choked up, uh, you know, the way, the way a lot of NASA missions do. Um, when Curiosity landed, uh, I was in a bar in the East Village, and it was like a Sunday night at 2 a.m., and the place was packed. And it was this really profound and emotional moment to see, you know, the, the seven minutes of terror end and confirmation that the robot had landed. And I mean, that's not even a manned mission, but it, the, the vision there is so grand that um, you know, I think it can really inspire people. And so you've got this dichotomy of very you know, kind of fun, you know, money and, and near-term business opportunity versus the, the visionary exploration-oriented um, uh, vision. And I, I think we're almost talking about two separate industries when, when you break it down like that. Let, let me take it. <laughs> so, uh, in the uh, time span between uh, 50 years ago and 50 years from now, I would post to you that actually this is not uh, the best time to start a space business. The best, no, the best time to start a, to have started to start a space business would have been in the early 90s, because in the early 90s was the start of direct-to-home television, the direct broadcast television, and the man who's made probably made more money in space than anyone else. It's not Elon Musk, it's a man named Charlie Ergen, who founded Echostar, which you know, is also his fish network. Um, that is the most massive market in space today. It is ranges somewhere in the 100, 150 billion dollar market is television. And it's the one actually is still growing because it's growing in the emerging markets. Um, when are we going to find something bigger than that? That's a good question. If we get to the minerals and the, and the asteroids, that plausibly gets you much bigger than that. Uh, but you have to go at great scale. Um, you could have uh, microgravity manufacturing, of course, that has to be at great scale. Um, it is going to take a while to do something bigger than television. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, views are the following again. Um, aerospace strictly is not an entity by itself. You know, it is an extension of many other fields. For example, if you look at satellites, right, you can basically subdivide that into imaging and communication, right? There are already many players in it. So one way to look at it is that you know the space-based business is augmenting and adding efficiency to the human economy, as opposed to discovering US accidentally while looking for spice in India. You know, I mean it's not like you go to a some nearby planet and asteroids and meet or to the new aliens with whom you can, you know, create whatever oranges or <laughs> <laughs> so it's not gonna like substantially do anything, you know, fundamentally new. But it will add a huge amount of efficiencies and uh, I mean those who are more engineering and mathematically inclined and financially able to very exciting projects, all whole host of new technologies and, 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 and projects and, and, and things that you can do. So so from, so from that perspective, it's a, it's a very exciting area. I'd just like to say also I have kind of utopian stars in my eyes, and I really do believe that it is something like finding a new world to, to, to enable access to space. There really are enormous resources out there, and that's really what people are looking for with the new world is resources, not just spice and gold and chocolate and all kinds of new things, right? And uh, I think there's a lot out there that, that we don't know about, and uh, there's a lot that enable energy, for instance, energy manufacturing in space could change the world, right? And I think that, you know, that that's part of the reason that I'm motivated in this industry. So let me ask the audience. I have a different view on the topic. <laughs> 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 I think we're here to debate. 
So let me ask the audience, who's involved in a space-related project here in this room? Wow. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Whoa, that's really so I would like to ask some of you who have raised your hands like, to describe your project very briefly and to uh, share the challenge that you're facing like, or to ask for advice. So maybe in region. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Say with me out. Hello, my name is Luigi, and I'm here with Kyle, and last summer we both interned over at NASA Goddard, and while our time there, we worked on a small CubeSat that is called uh, Dellinger, so that will launch at the end of this year, if not the beginning of next year. At that time, we found out that there's this challenge coming out that's called the Keep Quest, so we've been, you know, like running around back and forth. The Keep Quest is a challenge that if you do well on, the, <coughs> on these ground tournaments, you will get a free ride to the moon, so your CubeSat will go to the moon and you have to basically uh, try to orbit the moon, so that basically you have to try to be captured, right? And then the other aspect is that you have to communicate. Who can send the most amount of data, highest burst rate? And this is a lot for a small CubeSat. I mean, these things you just can't buy off the shelf. Yes, all the hardware for low Earth orbit, you can just buy off the shelf. But hardware really isn't the way to win in terms of like forming a company. So we're trying to do this, dedicate our two or, two or three years of our life, and then maybe, hopefully, we can demonstrate that this works, and build some kind of business model where we can basically either provide some type of uh, feature where we can help the rovers navigate on the moon, or we can also relay data from the moon. And yeah, so if you have some questions about that, you can ask Kyle and I afterwards. Okay. Thank you. And I saw some hands like maybe Achal and, and Jiwei can share your ideas about what you're doing related to space. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys call me up there. Uh, had a normal pulse rate. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually a small project as part of the new space embassy. So the reason uh, why a lot of us came together to start this organization was because of a project. We decided to make satellite uh, receivers, which could uh, get a uh, satellite signal from any satellite, uh, like Google, and all these big companies are now heavily, Facebook heavily investing in getting internet across uh, places where it's not available right now, especially the developing countries. And a big part of what they are using for this purpose is satellite communication. So the project that we are trying to work on is trying to build these receivers which are very cheap and can easily be sent to these uh, developing nations and uh, they can use satellite signals to get internet access. So that is one small project that we've started working on. Yeah. I see some other hands here, somebody would like to share, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hi, my name is Kurt. Um, I'm the operations financial officer for a company called Plus the Link here in the lab. Uh, uh, we provide services and software for multi objective optimization of additive manufacturing. Um, this kind of stuff is heard a lot in aerospace, but is also kind of trending across multiple uh, industries. We've decided to kind of beachhead in aerospace as well, and was kind of interested in hearing from you guys how much R&D you're doing uh, in creating components or complex components of low volume to make them more efficient, stronger, lighter, so they cost less, um, can be made in space, so on and so forth. So, yeah, let's give the opportunity for the panel to... Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to I mean, um, Honeybee Robotics, for a little while was going by Honeybee Robotics Spacecraft Mechanisms Corporation because <laughs> we, we would go to a prime like Ball Aerospace or Lockheed and they'd say, Honeybee, I thought you guys made robots. You make, you make space hardware? So um, about a third of our business is in building stuff for spacecraft that moves. So um, twist capsules and slip rings, uh, control moment gyroscopes, solar array deployment systems. Um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, every, you know, gimbals, everything but the the, um, the communications and, and the solar panels themselves and the bus. And um, I think uh, there's, that's a huge industry. It's really conservative. You know, that's like the, the classic uh, flight heritage problem where you need somebody to take a bet so that you can prove that this thing works in orbit no matter how much you, you lab test it and validate it um, on a vibe table or, or in a, a thermal vacuum chamber. 
Um, so yeah, that's a huge part of our business. Mm -hmm. I'd like to touch on that too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Final Frontier Design uh, announced a SpaceX review with NASA back in December to essentially human rate our suit for low Earth orbit and um, there's a crowd effect. And, uh, and company SpaceX, ULA, ATK. Uh, but one of the big challenges for that is the materials and processes certifications. We have uh, a number of components on our suit that are 3D printed. 3D printing makes an incredible amount of sense for us because we're anthropomorphically shaped uh, pressle, pressure vessel uh, that's made in very low volume, right? And we are constantly sort of updating and, and improving prototypes. Um, so uh, we actually have a strategic partnership with the Marshall uh, Space Flight Facility down in Huntsville, Alabama. They have a <coughs> manufacturing center there that is uh, working on uh, certifying through MAPTIS, NASA's Materials and Processes Database, um, individual components that have been added, additively manufactured. But it's, it's a struggle that we're running into. Right now, we're essentially defining the universe through the Space Act Agreement. What, what envelope are we operating in? What standards do we go by? There are no standards for additively manufactured components, according to NASA, and it's something that we essentially have to you know, be the guinea pig for uh, and write the book. And uh, it seems like uh, at Marshall, they're really interested in, in Connell and, you know, the very um, sort of rocket engine oriented things, whereas we're interested in nylon and stainless steel and, and, and more sort of regular everyday components that make, uh, make sense commercially uh, in, in low volumes. But yeah, that's, that's a, I think, a huge opportunity. It really changes the way we think about design, but also poses some huge problems. In, uh, as John said, who's going to take that bet and, and, and make it fly? <coughs> Other uh, space projects here? Okay, yeah, Chris? Hi, uh, Sydney said, my name is Chris. I'm a CSL entrepreneur here. We make uh, web authentication software that uses computer vision and deep learning to combat very, uh, very uh, bad uh, cyber threats and sort of work on problems like phishing, things like that. And uh, you might say, what does this have to do with, with space exploration? And as we've really touched upon, this is really kind of an area of a lot of cross-pollination. There's a lot of different factors that are involved, lots of different technologies that intersect in just the right way. And uh, a few months ago, uh, Vivex uh, Team Indus was actually in town with their CEO and their engineers, and they were describing some of the technical challenges that they were facing. And one of the things they are, in fact, looking to procure is an autonomous landing software system. So this is something whereby you have you know, this sort of moon orbiter that's traveling at two kilometers per second and it needs to go from that to a soft landing on the surface. And in that process, it needs to navigate away from hazardous things on the lunar surface like craters, boulders, and there are video cameras attached to the, to the descender. And based on that data, you want to be able to autonomously you know, use your thruster controls and avoid those kinds of problems. Um, so this is basically a, a potential project that we're looking for computer vision developers animation developers to generate and render images of the descent uh, process. That's just kind of a cool thing. I think they're, you guys are scheduled to launch, what, in 2016? Oh, that's right. Uh, originally for December 15th, but uh, XYZ itself was shifted by a year. And that's not the first time they've done it, given the size and magnitude. Of course. And so what it implies is that even our rocket schedule has been shifted back and, uh, within a margin of a few months. Yeah, so, that, so that should give you some sense of the, of the timeline for this kind of a project. So you should talk to one of us, if you or a friend, you have my patient in this project. Um, the second thing I'm kind of working on with like 5% of my time and I'm not working on my company is actually just a robotics class project with my friend Marcelo over there. And uh, this is in the area of uh, small sat imaging, which is a very popular um, topic we've also talked about. And we're really trying to validate some of the uh, new ideas that are coming out in the uh, small sat conferences, some papers that Skybox has, has recently published about accomplishing stereo imaging uh, from small satellites, which means you can not just get uh, real-time image data, but also like real-time point cloud data about specific points on the Earth's surface. And you can also dive deep into like super high resolution, um, you know, way, way, way uh, beneath the sub-meter uh, resolution that it's currently at. So it's just a couple of things we're working on. Uh, Marcel and I are working on some early simulations, um, and we're really looking specifically what kind of control infrastructure small satellites can support, like gyroscopic or thruster propulsion, things like that. Uh, that can accomplish these stereo vision kinds of tasks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, some, some here. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah, sure. Can I just? Sure. Sure. Uh, 
So Chris, uh, let's have a question to you. So given that uh, you, know, you might be able to accomplish uh, you know, the high resolution imagery architecture, have you guys given any thought to the legal restrictions? Uh, because yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the government would be quite wary, right, uh, that you're uh, crossing some uh, thresholds and uh, making people uncomfortable. I, I think if, if we were ever to approach Mark with this, we'd inevitably have to go through that process. I mean, if you look at Skybox and Planet Labs, for example, the limits to the resolutions that they can get are not technical, they are political, or they're, they're regulatory based. Um, we're really more at the stage of just validating this technology, and uh, you know, if and when we do up, bump up against those legal barriers, we would have those conversations, and there'd be very specific purposes where it could be permitted. And it's also a proof of concept for other really cool applications like imaging, uh, other uh, extraterrestrial bodies like the moon or the Martian surface that's super, super high resolution. It's like imagine getting the best maps that exist, that, you know, better than anything NASA or the Indian government has produced in the past. Um, this would also be a validation for that kind of technology and application. Chris, yes, over here in the back. Yeah, hi, my name is Chris Craddock. I'm the founder of Rocketstar. We're developing an altitude compensating upgraded aerospike engine that runs on water that hopefully will be getting you guys back to space. Awesome. So, you see a lot of uh, space companies here. Nobody expected that we were going to have so many space startups. So I think it's a good sign that. The, the time is now. Right? So, David, if you had something to go before, <laughs> back to back to panel. So, they, the, the point I was to make was was there were two really interesting questions. So, you had Logan Mather had the had the question of what stories, you know, how, how does storytelling fit into this? And then you had a question was what what big thing, what big profit motive is driving things? What's the what's the the spice group that's going to drive people to go to space? And and I would say that that's not, that's a, I have a very different approach to the question. Than um, I look here at entrepreneurs, right? And so, speaking as somebody who's a lifelong entrepreneur and an angel investor, and somebody who spends, who's invested in over 100 companies and sees, lives in this world, the power of entrepreneurship and, and excitement, and whether you call it the capitalist market or just the entrepreneurial drive, that, that's like saying, um, what's the lure of the internet? Or, you know, first, computers. Well, nobody would want computers in their own home, right? Well, okay, yeah, they do. And the internet, well, that can be used for you know, email. Well, yeah, and a whole hell of a lot more. So, you, so the existence of the internet has looked at, look at all of the entrepreneurs in the world who are doing things that are enabled by the internet now. It is it's the individual human entrepreneurial creative spirit that is envisioning things that are, that are doing this. And so I, I think you made a good point about there are two different, there's the, the visionary thing, which is exploration and, and, and adventure and go to the moon and jump down from you know, space. And, and that's wonderful. And that's great. That's one part of human existence. But the other part, this whole new space that we're investing in doing, that's an entrepreneurial world. That's not so much driven by, by you know, the guy, I, I want to be an astronaut or, or you know, I, I want to reach the stars. That's great. And that's wonderful. And that's a legitimate part of life. But that's not what's driving new space. What's driving new space is this entrepreneurial energy, which is really extraordinary. And in space, whether you're talking about Earth imaging or resource from planetary resources, or, or, or colonizing new things, or <coughs> forming Earth, or, or, or being able to deliver energy from the sun you know, down on things, there are, are so many, many, many things that if you're an entrepreneur, you can look, at, look up to the stars, look at space, and say, boy, I see a million different possibilities here for creating businesses and creating value. And I think that's what's driving new space. Yeah. It's always very encouraging to hear like this uh, positive tone from someone who's seen so much in the industry. Uh, in addition to entrepreneurs, I think there are some investors here. I hope this panel and uh, this discussion is also giving you an opportunity to understand a little bit more about the space industry. Just wondering if, the, for those of you who are more on the investment side, who would like to ask questions or who would like to make comments. Anybody here got money? Yeah. Are there any investors? I work for uh, my name is Dan Simon. I work for uh, I work for a company that does uh, primarily aircraft leasing. So we buy commercial airplanes, leasing to airlines. So you might not know this. United Virgin doesn't own their aircraft, but leasing for the most part. Um, my question for you guys is, and, and, and Ian, you sort of touched on this, what is the market for space? So the, the revenue seems to come from satellites and from defense stuff, you know, uh, nat, sort of NASA tenders, NASA contracts, things like that. How big is that market versus how big is the, um, the satellite 
imaging telecommunications market, either in percentage terms or in dollar terms, and do you see that as a as kind of a growing market as we go up and down in waves? I mean, how does that sort of look like eventually? Um, Preface by meandering. Um, <laughs> uh, space uh, is an odd thing to say you're investing in because space is uh, mostly emptiness. Um, <laughs> uh, there's not much there. The distances between anything is uh, pretty considerable. Um, and space has a number of properties that are uh, amenable to uh, uh, business. The biggest one is that it's the high ground, which means you can put a satellite there and image it or bounce communications off, off of the thing, or you can use it as a beacon. And that's been the biggest um, uh, you know, revenue generator in all sorts of different ways. You want me to break down the subsectors of the industry, the fixed satellite, and the mobile satellite, and the television, and the imaging. You know, There's reports that uh, will do that. I mean, you can go way down the fine grain uh, on that. Um, that's been one part. Uh, another uh, property of space is that it's very prestigious uh, to be in it for some reason. Um, and so governments have been uh, amenable to spending a lot of money doing a whole lot of programs. Some of it is actually in service of the first part, either for the mil but mostly for their military and intelligent purposes. But some of it is just to uh, send stuff to different places. Uh, so we could say that we did. We did and, uh, and explore stuff, uh, which is its own mo motivations. And so that supports um, uh, national civil uh, programs. And that's been sort of like that. And you can see the breakdown by country, by activity, um, by countries starting up that. Um, a third <coughs> property of, uh, and, uh, there's a few other properties of space that I'd like to, to, to see more gener uh, revenue generation. Uh, come out of one is the absence of gravity. I've always maintained that if uh, the absence of gravity was like an oven or refrigerator or a vacuum chamber, it would be an old bunch of industrial processes, um, just like the, the last three. Uh, the only problem is that getting to a zero gravity environment requires usually, or at least a persistent microgravity environment, usually involves going to lower orbits and going through uh, three years of bureaucracy. Uh, to do that. Um, uh, Nanorex, and here I am talking up my book again, uh, allows you to do that in much less time, nine months in, or, or less, and get to that box, that industrial process, eventually uh, on, on the space station. I'd like to see more revenue generation come out of that. Then there's the personal exper experiential thing, um, you know, the, the suborbital trips, the orbital trips, Orbital trips have been going for between uh, 20 and 50 million dollars a person. Uh, there have been eight trips so far. Um, I'm hoping with the, the new vehicle, the commercial vehicles coming online, that is going to, we're going to see um, considerably more people in the next decade, hopefully double digit numbers of people in, in, in the next decade. Uh, if we're really good, it'll be triple digits. Um, and that will be the start of another industry. Um, and, you know, there's the other property of space is that there's other planets there. I don't have any idea what the revenue line for that property of space is going to be. But if you have a 200-year projection, it'll, it, it should be in there in some form. <laughs> <laughs> part of your DCF analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, questions from investors, yes? Uh, it's not investors, but looking for money. It's a money question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, hypothetically, if somebody wants to start a SpaceX in Europe, let's say outside of ESA, where would one look for money at between 6 and 50 million? That's not enough. Uh, uh, there, there, there is, uh, there's one company that I consider almost a, uh, a competitive to SpaceX in Europe. Uh, it's a company. Um, uh, I don't own shares in this one, so I'm not talking to my book again. Uh, uh, there's a company called Reaction Engines, which I find fascinating in, in the UK. It's actually been around since the late 80s and comes out of a project from the mid-80s. Um, their, their technology is they use a hybrid rocket uh, jet engine 
that has, uh, and each engine has 3,000 kilometers worth of tubing uh, to do what it does. Um, so they're, they're working on the, uh, they've been working on the engine, the, the basis of it is a, a Skylon you know, space plane. Um, it's uh, gotten um, a variety of tranches of money from pri both private investors and from the European Space Agency and from the UK government. Um, the amount of money that they've put together over the years probably amounts to somewhere in the range of 100 to 150 million. Most of that's coming from has come from the British government in the last few years. Um, they've finally been able to get some traction. Um, it, as as you can tell, since they've been around since the late 80s, it's been an enormous slog for them. Um, I don't know anyone else uh, uh, other than the incumbent Ariana Spas. Uh, which gets its money from the, from the governments of Europe and from the European Space Agency is building, trying to build large rockets in, in, in Europe. Uh, there's this company in Spain that's trying to do smaller rockets enabled by balloons. I don't know how, where the, uh, I actually think they have two, fun, uh, two funding sources, like pension plan uh, funding sources, but I have no idea where else they, they find money. What Swiss space systems? S3. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, Swiss space systems too. There's also There's a plane cup in at, in orbital. at the moment, but they no. say suborbital. They say orbital. Yeah. Who knows, right? What about Firefly? Any company? Firefly? They're not in Europe. No, right. I was thinking about Firefly. So not. Never mind. I got confused. So we still have 15 minutes, uh, and I would like now to move and think about the future, right? The road ahead. And uh, one year from now, when we're going to have this event again, hopefully with uh, um, an audience as engaged as we have here tonight, what important new trend will we be ta talking about in that conference? And even further, what's your counterintuitive, half crazy prediction about the next five to ten years in the space industry? And this is something for everyone here in the panel. <laughs> first question is about like, the short term trend and what we're going to be talking about next year. This year, we're talking about imaging, internet satellites. This is probably we're going to be talking next year or something else. And then, like, five to ten years from now. Um, I can tell you what people were talking about at the satellite conference in DC, which I was at last week. Um, it, uh, a lot of sort of talk about low Earth orbit constellations, uh, particularly one with, um, uh, which is the Qualcomm uh, Virgin Group uh, backed group um, that's trying to launch about 650 satellites. Uh, there's also the SpaceX uh, support, uh, apparently planned constellation. Elon wants to put 4,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. Uh, there's another plan, a plan called LeoSat, which is only looking at 120 which is still also going to be the largest constellation yet deployed. Uh, maybe Planet Labs will exceed them because they're just sending out lots of little ones all the time. Um, so that's what we're talking about this year. And it's, it's really a this year phenomenon because these things have been announced in the last few months. Um, what will we be talking about next year? Um, probably a lot of the same thing. Um, if, if, if SpaceX is closer to reusability, then we'll be talking about that. Uh, I may have some things that I'm working on that we maybe all be talking about. Probably not next year. Um, uh, what we would be look, talking about in the long term? Oh, definitely the things I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> With luck, next year we'll be talking about the first flights of Virgin Galactic and X Core. Uh, Sarah Brightman yeah. will be going up and coming down. I mean, this is more on the consumer market side. Uh, 10, 20 years, I really hope we're talking about Mars. Uh, we might be able to retire sometime towards the end of that, and I want some other people there getting it ready for me. Yes. <laughs> it's a great retirement place because. You weigh only a third. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually fascinating. So, so last week was the TED conference in Vancouver, and I was at TED. 
uh, and Stephen Petrenik did a whole thing about the, the future of space and where things are going. Um, and he did the whole Elon Musk, you know, Mars, you know, and then you know he's projecting here, you know, it's going to happen within you know 15, 20 years. And I was fascinated because the Ted audit, there was an enormous amount of skepticism. I would have thought a lot, you know, it's the whole space crowd, and we all think you know, we're going to Mars, or, of course we're going to Mars in, in, in 20 years. But the, the right, that has not reached out to the full population yet, which I think is very interesting. And I think that disconnect is going to be preached. I think we are, we are eventually going to have a lot more people thinking like us, we've given this whole exponential change in technology that, yeah, you all will be there, and before Esther retires, she'll be happy. Yeah, we can come visit Esther's home on Mars. For the <laughs> no, not for the weekend, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. walk her, walk her. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the way to go to Mars is to retire. It's not to go back and forth. If anybody has a book, read the book of the Martian. It's an amazing book. It's like the Martian. Yeah, gotta read it. You gotta read it. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, I think I know exactly what I'm reading. That was really good. The movie's coming out, too. Matt Damon. Yeah. Matt Damon. Oh, cool. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know what we'll talk about in five to ten years, but I think I know exactly what we're talking about next year is how poorly humans do in microgravity. Uh, just today, uh, we sent up to an astronaut <coughs> cosmonaut to be up in space for a year, and uh, I think that it's going to be really horrible for the human body, and uh, that'll be a really interesting conversation to have with you. Do you know how much the astronauts exercise in the bloody space station? It's like, what, six hours a day? Four hours? What, what is it? Two, two hours? Three hours? Every day? Push it over. So, uh, so no. they should. They, they should bother to go to Esther's place. Who doesn't do that? So, 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 well, so, you know, point number one that I'm, I'd like to make is that you know, I'm just reevaluating what Ian, uh, uh, you know, just uh, indicated about uh, this huge surge towards small satellites and constellations and you know, less than 10 kilograms to 50 plus to 100 plus, and a whole host of players coming. And one must also bear in mind that you know there are different economies. So there's a U.S. mindset and, 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 and way of doing business. And, and from what I understand, within India itself, there's a lot of interest in uh, in small satellites, and uh, and these new young startup firms are bubbling up. So our company, Team Indus, is apparently not the first one to uh, make an attempt at uh, small satellites. There's probably another firm. And the average age there is, I think, 21 or something. You know. So you feel like, you know, can you have very well advanced in terms of engineering this, getting launch contracts, and uh, uh, you know, having agreements, and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, pushing this forward. Point number two is more of a question, and to the point that you had raised uh, initially about uh, uh, and, and long-term rise in terms of uh, uh, cost structures, how they will pan out over years, decades. And uh, primarily in terms of launch contracts. So launch is the key determinant of the, of the space business. I mean, that needs the, the, the share. And the key reason is you have to defeat the gravity. So it's your basic physics, your, uh, uh, your, your high school track and physics, and you have to defeat the Earth, and then you have to generate a certain amount of critical velocity, and then and, 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 and to get out. And therefore, there's a critical amount. Like, I think the cheapest rocket on this planet is the Indian rocket. Uh, it's a robust, it's a world cost, and it costs about 20 million bucks. But I mean, the, the questions are, you know, unlike the microelectronics miniaturization on account of Moore's law and, and, and quantum physics and, 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 and so on and so forth, whereby you can project and make a claim that, oh, you know, the forms will keep defining plus in this time horizon. But on the other hand, when you look at propulsion systems, right, chemical thrusters, rockets, and you don't need gravity, I mean, I'm not sure you can say, okay, well, you know, 100 years from now, this curve is just going to keep going down. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I just, I'm just trying to, I'm putting on my physicist's hat and trying to see what, where is this confidence that there will be a sharp decline in cost in, in terms of launch, right? So. Reusability does a lot in the lower costs. Yeah. Yep. There's some final thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but, uh, you know, we've been hearing all about Skybox and you know, swarms of, of small satellites. Um, we haven't talked at all about drones, and I think in the next year or two, there's just going to be this embarrassment of riches when it comes to data and connectivity <laughs> options, um, whether you're talking about imaging or wireless communication. And a lot of these uh, satellite companies are going to have to compete with, you know, a relatively low-cost, uh, unmanned, solar-powered plane that can loiter at, you know, 100 miles an hour up in the stratosphere, rather than needing to take them on at 18,000 miles an hour um, and have a lifetime of 24 months. So, uh, I, I think it is just going to be more and more competition, and that's probably beneficial for end users. A um, little longer term, probably international developments, you know, the 
the word Taikonaut is probably going to be as common as cosmonaut now, and um, that's, that's good for everyone. Yeah, so before wrapping up, just a few announcements. Uh, New Space NYC is hosting a few events here. So some of you have already joined these events every, uh, every other Friday, pretty much. And the idea is to, have in a smaller setting, discuss things like, you know, we had team members presenting uh, the, their, uh, their project. We had x recently. We had um, Michael Najar, who's a German artist who's doing groundbreaking art related to, to space. So if you, you're interested, please visit our website, newspace.nyc, and uh, sign up for, for the announcements. And uh, I would like to uh, ask our New Space NYC members to raise your hands, because then if you have any questions, just please reach out to our colleagues and uh, talk about your interests, and maybe we'll find ways to help you connect with investors, connect with uh, potential partners in academia, or uh, even people who might be interested in in the things that you might be doing. So we'll be happy, we're here to help. So and finally, we'd like to uh, thank our panelists for this great discussion and hope to see you again in the next event. Thank you very much.